Hey, what's up fiber folks? Welcome back or welcome to High Fiber Knits. My name is Emily and today we are doing a knit and chat video. At this point, I've been knitting for about 18 months. I started in November of 2020 and many of you folks may know I'm at like a transitional stage in my life, finishing my master's program. Um, and starting to teach tomorrow. So I've been reflecting a lot um, on just everything, but also the role that knitting's played in my life for the past year and a bit. And the project I'm working on today is my Vegas top by Suzanne Muller. Uh, this is Farmer Daughter Fibers, Farmer's Daughter Fibers, Juicy DK in the colorway Spring Fever. Lots of fun, colorful speckles. Um, and I showed this in my most recent podcast when I just had a little strip of it done and I said I would reach out to the designer to inquire about the size range because currently it only goes from a 32 inch to a 50 inch vest and she got back to me which I was really happy about and she said that in order for her to increase her size range which she would like to do uh, she would need test knitters who could test those larger sizes in, in German for her. So I wanted to follow up on that because I said I would do it and I did it. So uh, this is what I'm working on for today. A really great summer st staple, I believe. Uh, so hopefully, I mean, if you speak German, I know most of my viewership is uh, perhaps or probably English speaking being from Canada, the US and the UK, but if you speak German and you would like to test knit the larger sizes for her, the pattern will be linked below. So yeah, without further ado, I think we're going to get started. I'm just drinking water from my beaker mug, but you should grab a cozy beverage for yourself. I feel like I'm going to be talking a lot and so I'm going to need to be drinking a lot of water. So. We'll jump straight into it because I think there's like 17 or 18 points in my notes. Um, and some of them are more profound, I suppose, and others are like more on the practical side of like, just like good knitting, technically speaking. So starting with one of those more profound ones, uh, the biggest reflection I've had is just how much of a privilege it is to knit it's had such a tremendous and positive impact on my mental health since I began knitting. I've always been a really crafty person, uh, but I've never had something that is as consistent a thing in my life as knitting is. With that being said, to be able to knit is a privilege because I have the time to knit. I am able-bodied enough to knit. I can access resources for learning like through YouTube uh, and Ravelry for patterns for example. I have the financial and physical access to materials, specifically yarns, that are good quality and bring me a lot of joy and I have no trouble finding patterns in a size range that accommodates my measurements and suits my personal style. Uh, so I'm really grateful for being able to knit and being able to experience the positive impacts of knitting on my mental health and well-being. The second thing that I've learned is that sustainability in crafting is not black and white. When I started knitting, I thought, oh, like, of course, if you're making your own clothes, it's automatically more sustainable than purchasing fast fashion. And while I still think that's true, I think there is, it's not so black and white what sustainability and crafting actually means. And I think there's a lot of this notion that sustainability in crafting is using the like small batched local or ethically sourced fibers supporting only indie, for example, and while those are all great things, I think uh, just being 
mindful of the fact that like we can't do all the girl good the world needs but the world needs all the good we can do uh that's very important uh because i think well as i mentioned it's a privilege to be able to knit and i think in both the crafting sphere of things and the sustainability sphere of things there can be some elitism that excludes certain folks from participating on the basis of some of the very valid choices that they make and so yeah sustainability and crafting it does look like using ethically produced materials but it also looks like finding things secondhand when you can purchasing mindfully and consuming only really what you need and what brings you joy because I think there can be tendencies to excess in knitting which then kind of defeats the purpose of the practice of knitting to combat overconsumption due to fast fashion uh we're just sort of replacing the behaviors with different materials uh in that case and so yeah sustainability in knitting is a gray area it can look like a lot of different things but i think just by knitting and taking that time to slow down you're already taking a great step the third thing that i've realized is that i shouldn't test knit patterns that i wouldn't want to pay or purchase the pattern in order to knit by test knitting you are supporting the designer's small business which i think is a wonderful thing and test knitting can be a really good opportunity to get a pattern without having to pay for it try some new techniques try a new construction and all of that but i think test knitting just for the sake of getting a pattern for free is not good enough reason on its own and this isn't me trying to be like you're a bad person or you're like thoughtless if you test knit patterns that you're like on the fence about or anything like that not at all um but i think it's still important to be as intentional as possible in crafting and one of the things i ask myself when i am purchasing things outside of craft so if i'm at the thrift store for example is if I would still purchase the item if it were not in the thrift store, but rather full price at the mall. And that answer, the answer to that question is usually very helpful for me to decide uh, whether or not I truly see the, the item working for me. And I think that can be extended to our pattern selections as well and can support the overall intentionality in our craft and making garments at least that we will actually love to wear once we have finished them of course that being said that is a very like product knit mindset uh if you're more of a process knitter and you for example gift a lot of your finished objects then take what i say with a grain of salt take everything i say with a grain of salt to be honest the next thing I learned is a very, very practical one. I don't like knitting flat and seaming. I much prefer knitting in the round. And that's something that I learned very, very fast. I don't think I need to say much more about it. Uh, another thing I learned really, 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 really fast is to take care of your body. You know, as knitters, the most valuable tool we have is our physicality like I said it's a privilege to be able-bodied such that we can knit and so sitting with good posture doing your wrist and your shoulder stretches and taking breaks for your eyes and snacks and hydrating all just really important things for making sure that we can knit for a long time just keeping ourselves overall as healthy as possible. 
the next thing, I think we're like at number six now, that I learned is that yarn substitutions are about more than getting gauge. So my first big girl project was the Sunday Sweater by Petite Knit. And I believe that pattern's written for Camarose Snuffnug, which is a really light and airy blown yarn. And I substituted Barocco Vintage Chunky, which is an acrylic wool blend, like a really bulky weight, really high twist um, yarn. So even though I got gauge, the fiber content and the construction of that yarn was so different that my finished object didn't fit or feel or look like what it really should have based on the recommendations made by Petite Knit. And so from that, I kind of learned, you know, more than just getting gauge, pay attention to the fiber composition of the substitutions you're making, as well as the construction of the yarns that you're substituting because uh, you can have equivalent yarns in terms of their fibers, uh, but something that is spun to have a lot of air in it will give you less or fewer meters per, or no, it'll be more meters per gram because it'll be lighter, more meters per gram than something that's spun to be very dense, essentially. And this is a lesson that I actually was able to apply to my advantage later on in my knitting. Uh, my first version of the camisole number four by My Favorite Things Knitwear, I knit in Knitting for Olive Pure Silk, which is the yarn that the pattern calls for, and it came out beautiful. It's an absolutely lovely summer top, but I feel a little scared <laughs> when I wear it because the fabric, written exactly as the pattern suggests, I just find a little bit too light and a little bit too delicate for my taste. So when I decided I wanted to knit the pattern for a second time, I looked for fibers that were going to give me a little bit more weight and a little bit more drape. Sorry, I have my, um my cake of yarn inside this little planter because it's like the perfect size to be a yarn bowl. Anyway, I digress. Uh, when I was selecting yarns for my second camisole number four, I opted for something with cotton and tencel because those plant-based fibers gave me a lot more weight uh, to the fabric than just having the pure silk held single. So I thought that was kind of cool. But in a similar vein, you don't have to knit a pattern exactly as it is written. You can take a sweater that's knit for, uh, that's meant for like fingering weight merino wool and just do only mohair. It's up to you, it's your craft. You can make whatever choices you want, I guess. Uh, the next thing I learned is that I like color and I'm really inspired by it. And that was a really big surprise for me because until I started knitting, my wardrobe was basically just black and gray. And it was a running joke between my boyfriend and I, my partner and I, that I could wear gray tops for two weeks straight and still not to need to do laundry and have more gray tops to wear. Like I had so much clothing, so much fast fashion stuff and it was all colorless. I mean, I'm wearing black today, but I love this jacket, it's so comfy. Uh, but beside the point, I was really surprised when I started knitting and I was looking for yarns and I found myself attracted to colors that I just wasn't really expecting. And that's been pretty constant. And so it's been a lesson for me because uh, as inspired as I am by color, I still want to make mindful yarn choices. Uh, so for folks who may know 
uh, Kendra from Balanced Skein and I hosted a whole make-along called the Safe for Work make-along, which was all about producing garments that have utility. And I think a big part of that is working within a color palette so that the things we knit work with the things that we already own. Again, this is a very like product-based mindset with respect to knitting and the function of finished objects. Uh, but for me, knowing that I need to be intentional about color uh, has really slowed down the speed at which I purchase yarns. Uh, it took me like many, 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 many months to even just pick a color gray for my champagne cardigan by Petite Knit and I'm so glad that I did. And I'm so glad that I was also really picky about my buttons. <laughs> because uh, then you just get pieces that you're you're thrilled with and that work with your wardrobe and so no matter what day it is no matter what else you want to wear you can wear also a knitted garment and just feel cool the next thing i learned is that there are just like in fast fashion trends in knitting and i don't need to participate in all of them if i don't want to I think you can very easily appreciate trends without having to knit them. And I think this also ties into uh, intentionality and understanding our own personal styles, what works for us, what doesn't. Uh, and so one example I can think of for myself uh, is the balaclava, which gained momentum because of social media and was very quickly picked up by DIYers, specifically knitters, and crocheters and I thought that the idea was kind of cool and I was being influenced by how pervasive it was on social media but I just knew if I made a balaclava I would not wear it. Many of you have probably seen me on this channel with my hair down and naturally curly because it's there's a lot of it and it is naturally curly but like this isn't gonna fit comfortably into a balaclava and I just knew it wasn't gonna be for me but I still loved watching everybody's tutorials on how to make them and seeing the different kinds of constructions for the balaclavas but it wasn't a trend that I felt I wanted to participate in and similarly there's currently like the big like ruffle craze that uh has been generated in part by the souffle by Laura of Penrose Knits. And I have just had the greatest time seeing how much joy that pattern has brought to the people who have knit it so far. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's so feminine and really like it has so much personality to it, uh, but I just can't see myself wearing a ruffle. So I will, admire through the screen, but it's not likely to make it to my needles. And if it does someday, I will refer back to this video <laughs> to make sure I'm keeping myself accountable to what I've said. So yeah, there's trends in knitting. Again, with intentionality, take what works for you and leave what doesn't. I think now going on to my next point, the pressure to participate in trends, even in knitting, is a byproduct of the role that social media plays in the knitting community. And when I think about the role of social media in knitting, a lot of people have talked about how they reach a point where it feels like they're just knitting to produce content at very high speed and I think especially for Instagram where the relevance of whatever you post whether it's a grid photo a story or a reel like everything on Instagram is so transient I think there's a little bit more longevity or permanence uh, when it comes to YouTube but a lot of folks saying like they were just knitting to produce content and like chasing growth through service of the algorithms 
uh, or whatever. And I think that creates really unhealthy relationships with social media. And that's not anybody's particular fault. If we think about it, like our brains, like humans didn't evolve with social media present in terms of evolutionary history. Social media is so new. And so that like dopamine rush, that literal chemical reward uh, in our brain is a signal of this is good. Continue to do this. And we can't tell the difference. Physiologically, your brain cannot tell the difference between the pleasure that comes from getting likes on Instagram and eating your favorite food. So it's nobody's fault. And I don't think anybody started their social media as a way to feed their brain with dopamine. I think most folks in the knitting community at least began their social medias, myself included, uh, as a means to connect with each other and to find community. And so while numbers climbing can feel good physiologically, like, sure, I hit like the Instagram jackpot and my numbers have been growing consistently. That's neat, but the most excitement to me comes when I receive a DM because somebody's telling me that they cast on a pattern or uh, tried out a new yarn or even visited the knitting loft uh, on the basis of my recommendation or even just getting to meet people and have conversations with people. Like when I met uh, Rachel from Night Sky Knitting for coffee in Toronto in person, like that was so cool. And I think that's sort of the way or the role of social media that I think has a very positive impact on my like knitting life. And so, you know, when I'm like, oh, I should make content, if I'm feeling like the pressure to produce so that I can keep momentum with the analytics or the numbers, I just remind myself that I'm not doing this for influence, uh, influence or numbers per se. I'm doing it for the community or for have, for building a community. For the community, it sounds kind of funny. Anyway. Uh, the next thing I learned, also a pretty practical one, blocking. It's magic, but it's not limitless. So I don't know if I'm going to say too much more about that. I think there are some people who are like better equipped to speak on blocking than I am. For example, like blocking lace and cables and shawls versus like I told you in my last episode, I only just first blocked a sock very, very recently after having knit several pairs. So blocking does a lot of good things, but it will not completely transform your mistakes, I guess is a better specific way to put it. Another thing I've learned in my year of knitting, which is more closely tied to my dabbling in spinning, is that books are an amazing resource. Uh, we use, or I use, a lot of YouTube videos uh, as a way to learn techniques. Uh, watching other people's podcasts has been like my largest source of learning. But when I started spinning, I kind of struggled to find as much breadth of information or learning resources. Uh, and so I turned to my public library's website and I got a whole bunch of ebooks on spinning and natural fibers and fiber properties and all of those things. And I learned so much from doing that and reading those books helped to sort of consolidate some of the things I was learning informally about like fiber and yarn construction and all of those different things. And I think that learning that came from those books uh, made me feel much more confident in making my subsequent yarn selections and all of that. So 
books, fabulous resource. Also great if you just like to have information presented in a different way. Not everybody can learn from videos as effectively as they feel they can learn from things that are written or still images. So just a good option to lean into. The next thing I've learned is to count. Just count. Count, 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 count your stitches. Because I have been burned on many occasions for not counting my stitches. Specifically thinking about my Luminin pullover test knit for Sari Nordland last fall. I had to rip out and redo the raglan like four times because I kept missing raglan stitches and I wasn't counting my stitch distribution as often as I should have been to make sure I was on the right track. Now, from that, I've also learned that I really like when patterns tell me after each like significant step how many stitches I should have on my needles and what the distribution of the stitches should be between stitch markers or in each stitch repeat if they've been increasing or decreasing throughout the repeat, uh, like in a lace yoke, for example, uh, or on a shawl. Yeah, really helpful. Just count. I used to be like, oh, it's so cool that like people can do stuff without stitch markers or without needle cables or cable needles or anything like that. And now I'm at the point where I'm like, whatever makes it easier. The less mental gymnastics uh, and mental math I need to do when I'm knitting, the happier I am. So count. Uh, the next thing uh, is just go with your gut. If you're working on something and you're completely not vibing with it, frog it back and use the yarn for something else. Andrea Mowry talks about this all the time. Knitting is one of the very few, if not the only craft where we can quite easily reuse our materials, specifically yarn. Of course, like you should be able to reuse your needles and all of that. Um, but yeah, if you're if one of your purposes for knitting is to curate your wardrobe to be very specific to your taste and your style uh, and just be a bit more slow fashion based, you're not going to achieve that if you're making stuff you don't like and that you're not going to want to wear by forcing yourself to unpleasantly work on something you already know is not going to fulfill your expectations. Ah, lots of folks talk about this quite a bit. For example, Bethany from Well Loved Knits uh, is very open about how much she frogs throughout her own creative process as a designer. Um, and the fact that, yeah, it might take some like courage, you might need some physical and mental space from a project before you have the uh, will to frog it, but frog it if you feel the need to. <laughs> the next thing I learned is to just do it. Don't procrastinate on trying new techniques. You can practice on scrap yarn. I usually practice on the project when it's time to do the technique for the first time, uh, but Knitting is really one of those things I think that is where like the whole, like the finished object is greater than the sum of its parts. And when I started knitting, I would get like really scared when I would read full patterns before I started them because it just seemed like such a big undertaking and I really felt that way when I signed up to test knit the Celeste T for Sari Nordland because I had just done my Sunday sweater by Petite Knit which is quite simple circular yoke shaping I would say and the Celeste T was this all over 
lace yoke. And I was like, oh my gosh, am I like crazy for signing up to do this test knit? And then I started it and I realized that there were very few things that I had to do in that pattern that I hadn't done before or that I couldn't learn very easily with a YouTube video. And so really in my mind, knitting became this thing where it's just combining a whole bunch of really simple steps uh, to make something more complex and beautiful, but certainly not something that I should be scared of doing in the way that it like would hold me back from learning or growing or improving in the craft. So just do it. No, re no reason to be scared. That being said, there are still some times where I'm like, eh, I really don't want to start on this because I really don't feel like doing a provisional cast on. That's normal. Our motivation ebbs and flows. I didn't put I didn't put a stitch marker or like a progress keeper to see how far I've gotten, but you can kind of see I didn't alternate skeins with this. And I think in some parts you can see like the first skein, the speckles were really dense. And in the second skein, you can see like here, not so much. Oh well, lesson learned, alternate skeins, maybe someday, not today. Uh, okay. Oh, I like this one. I'm scrolling through my notes. You're like propped up on my laptop. Uh, I really like this one. Scraps have just as much potential as garment quantities in your stash. I feel like I could do another whole video on scraps alone, but um, I think using scraps is really great for a handful of reasons. First, you're saving money because you already own the stuff. Second, you're saving the environment because again, you already own the stuff. So you're not creating demand for more resources or creating a larger carbon footprint for like moving materials around and all that. You can clear up some physical and some mental clutter. I know some folks experience a certain level of guilt surrounding their stash and how fast they do or do not use it uh, and I think using scraps can stretch your creativity to like a different level I think for example I actually just finished these today I showed in my last podcast episode these little mug rugs that I made with some scraps from uh, hats and socks that I knit last year and so I finished them today because I just added the fringe but they look like little carpets that you can put your mugs on and I thought this was an excellent stash buster and this is like a yarn combination that I wouldn't have done with brand new yarns. I only did these yarn combinations because I had scraps that I was looking to use up, but I think they're so fun and I think they look so cute together. So, scraps, so much potential there. <sighs> Love water, okay. Next up, make a playlist. I, like I said, have done a lot of my learning through YouTube and a lot of the times I watch a video and I watch it so that I can complete the technique for the pattern that I'm working on and then I close the video and then, sorry. Okay, this isn't gonna work. Then I close the video, I finish the pattern and then I am working on another project and I need to use the technique again but I've forgotten how to do the technique and then I have to find the same video all over again. And then also sometimes because I share what I do here on YouTube and I share what I do on Instagram, folks have asked me what resources I've learned or I've used to learn particular things. Uh, and so I'm not doing this yet, but I think I might like go back through my watch history on YouTube or something and just make a document that links to 
all of the resources I've used and I've liked for quick reference. I also usually, I'll say, I usually watch a few different videos when I want to learn a new technique just to make sure that I'm learning the right thing. Like I've, I'm checking mostly that those videos are doing the same thing. They're consistent with one another. Uh, so that's a pro tip because I definitely have noticed a couple of times some like inconsistencies between videos that might have possibly caused me problems uh, if I hadn't otherwise looked at more videos. Is that a proper sentence? I don't even know. All good. All good. Okay. Next thing is, or last thing actually, I think this is like the 17th thing on my list. Uh, the last thing is that knitting is has made me a lot more picky about basically everything I welcome into my wardrobe now. Uh, as I mentioned, I try to be a mindful consumer. I do a lot of my clothing purchases secondhand through either just plain old thrift stores uh, or I really love Poshmark for being able to look for specific things from specific brands. Not sponsored, I just truly love Poshmark. Um, so I do try to do most of my purchasing secondhand and I had mentioned that rule for myself where, you know, if I wouldn't pay full price for it, then it's not even worth it to buy in the thrift store. $5 versus $50, do I still want it kind of thing. Uh, but I just noticed that like, now that I understand fiber and I know like more about the properties of different natural fibers, versus synthetic fibers like polyester or acrylic, uh, I am very, very, very particular now about the things that I purchase uh, in terms of their color, the quality, the fits, the material that they're made out of, uh, whether or not they fit into my style. I just become very, very judicious um, as a byproduct of my you know, thought process and intentionality in knitting that's really extended to my wardrobe and my style as a whole. And it makes sense in knitting because like if you're spending all this time and this money to create a project, you want it to be something that's going to be good, that you're going to get use out of, again, product-based thinking. Uh, but I didn't expect it to, is the word percolate, permeate? I didn't expect it to have an effect on the other aspects of my consumption habits. So that's kind of cool. It's actually a really big plus. So those are all of the things I learned in my first year of knitting. Again, I didn't put a progress keeper in on this, but I have no clue how many rows I did. Uh, I am about like halfway through knitting the body. I think I'll have enough. Um, I cut the first skein a little early so that I can do the edge finishing around the neck and the armholes because uh, I wanted to just basically work until the end of the second skein on the body as far as length goes, but this is a super wash yarn. So I am expecting it to grow in all directions upon blocking, but yeah, here, I'll give you like a little sneak peek at this fabric. It's really beautiful. And I think it's coming off very cool toned on the camera. It's definitely creamier in person. I'll see, I've tried photographing it a couple times already. I've struggled a little bit, but I am very much looking forward to having this as a summer staple in my wardrobe. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me ramble at, at long length about all of the things I've learned in my first year of knitting. 
Um, I know I talked about how like, oh, it's not about making content, but I have noticed that in the videos that I plan a bit less and just you know, go and I talk and same thing with like Instagram, like the random times I just flick on my camera and go, those things tend to be enjoyed. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for hanging out with me. I really appreciate any support you provide to me through you know, this channel by watching, liking, subscribing, commenting down below, all the things. Uh, I'm just here having fun and I hope you are too. So uh, until I get to see you again, I wish you all health and happy knitting. Bye everyone.